Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of philosophy of science, Philosoc. McLean versus Arkansas. The philosophy of science is important because one of the pinnacle issues is about demarcation. That is, what exactly is science in the first place? And that is an important question because we want to be able to tell when someone's bullshitting us, saying, trust me, science says so. But if you check what they believe and it isn't actually based on science, we often get the response, well, who gets to say what science is and isn't anyway? Well, philosophers of science, yes, that's our job, the problem of demarcation. But issues with philosophy do, in fact, affect society. In 1981, a lawsuit was filed in the U.S., the Eastern District of Arkansas, where the court of a government had to venture where philosophers actually do battle, putting the responsibility of saying down clearly what is and therefore what isn't science. The job fell on to Judge William Overton. Wait, why are we doing this? It was an early court case where the government representative had to state what the government will say what science counts as because of the succession of creationists being able to push the idea of balance with alternative sciences, a sneaky way to teach intelligent design in science class. They called it the Balance Treatment for Creation Science and Evolution Science Act. Wait, what is creation? It's the idea that God fashions life on earth as it is typically by biblical means and probably the most sciencey version of the creation is intelligent design. Does that sound like religion? Does that mean if we allow for balance with so-called alternative science we might get religion? Yes. The answer is yes. And if we can present religion as science, they can teach your kids Christian religious beliefs in science class. Well, people weren't having that. Whether atheist or non-Christian or Christian with full belief in creation but still believed science class should only have science and if you want to teach religion, religion, <laughs> and if you want to teach religion, it should only be done in religious class. Anything otherwise would be concerning. Hence the philosophical problem in the philosophy of science, the issue of demarcation. Can religion have a science? What counts as science? Is creation science a legitimate type of science? Are all questions that pertain to this issue of demarcation. And hence, McLean versus Arkansas. Judge William Overton, with input from philosophers of science, made a definition of what science is and judged that creation science isn't science and that the Balance Treatment for Creation Science and Evolution Science Act is unconstitutional and therefore religion, even religious science, can't be taught in science class, once and for all. Well, actually, it only held jurisdiction in the Eastern District of Arkansas, but it was very important historical post for an early and impactful case that led to similar decisions later, not in small part because of a sort of crusade, I guess one could ironically say, that Judge Overton took to keep creation science out of science class after this case. Thank you, Judge Overton. It is thanks in part to you that children in the Western world aren't being duped into thinking Christian science is just another kind of science, and so my Buddhist children need not even learn about Christian theological dispositions while in science class. But philosophers never stop battling. The science war goes on. Philosophers, even those that fully agree to never let religion or creation science into the science class, continue to battle. On today's battle, Larry Lawden versus Michael Roos. Before going over the battle, after editing this entire video, I realized it might be worth giving some context of the battle itself. Uh, despite my phrasing, this battle isn't direct between Lawden and Roos. Actually, what's happening is that Lawden is going to attack Overton, or rather Overton's opinion, and make a suggestion for an alternative that still keeps religion out of the classroom. Michael Roos will come in and defend Overton and at the same time attack Larry Lawton's suggestion. That's the context of the battle as we go through it. Also, to be clear, this is not an attack on religion. If you want to believe in religion or have faith in religion, go right ahead. In fact, you may even want to continue believing that religion has no direct conflict with science at all. That can be perfectly fine as well. This issue, to be clear, is about whether or not you could teach a religious version of science if science can have a religious version 
or in this specific case, whether you could teach in the science classroom creation science that is specifically a Christian version of creation. Lauren strikes first. Let's see his goal and strategy. I will quickly take you through science at the bar, causes for concern, with some of my own messy notes. Lawton brings up the McLean vs. Arkansas case, and he does say that the fans of science would be pleased at the outcome. Creationism should not be taught in class. Creationists, though, he says, clearly made a botch of their case. In fact, he says Judge William Overton's ruling da, 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 may come to a haunt us. He says the verdict may be right, but for all the wrong reasons. By a chain of arguments, he even calls hopelessly suspect. That's pretty strong language he's using there. He says it relies on a misrepresentation of what science is and how it works. He says the crux of Overton's ability to judge what is and therefore what is not essentially science depends upon what he calls the essential characteristics of science five so-called essential properties that demarcate scientific knowledge. One, that it's guided by natural law. Two, that it has to be explanatory by reference to natural law. Three, that it is testable against the empirical world. Four, that its conclusions are tentative. Five, that it is falsifiable. It's come to my attention that falsification will figure up a lot in this battle, and after initially editing this video, I realized it might be worth giving a brief description of falsification, since neither Lauden or Roos actually did give any description or basic a nutshell version of what falsification even is. But I think, perhaps in my case, I'm not going to just assume that my audience already knows some philosophy of science. So, falsification is the issue over having the quality of being falsifiable which makes you, in a way, accountable to the world, the empirical world, the world as we sense it. In a nutshell, to be falsifiable, one has to say, or be able to say, if you find this X, then I'm wrong. So yes, I can be wrong, and under such and such a circumstance, you'll prove me wrong. I'll admit it. You find this thing, and I'm wrong. So for example, say one of your friends says, all swans are white, and you want to contest him. They might want to respond, well, prove me wrong. Show me a non-white swan, and I'll admit, not all swans are white. So then you do. You show them a black swan. Black swans are found in Australia. They found this much after this case it was even used, but they used to say all swans are white until they actually found a black swan, thereby overturning their belief that all swans were white. In effect, all swans are white became falsified. So being falsified isn't so great because you got proven wrong, but having been falsifiable was great because it still shows that at least you were in a way accountable to the world, the empirical world, the world as we sense it. Now compare that to another friend who says something and says nothing you can show me would ever prove me wrong, or rather would ever make me admit that I'm wrong and change my beliefs. This shows your beliefs aren't connected to the world in this important way, since nothing of the world could possibly change your beliefs. You're going to believe what you believe regardless of what the world actually is. So that's very briefly what falsifiability means. Now I'm going to go over the actual battle here, and if you want to skip the actual battle, although I suggest you actually do go over it with me, you can skip it by clicking over here. Now firstly, he groups it into saying that A, 1 and 2 are basically being law-like and explanatory, and B, the rest pretty much have to do with fallibility and testability. Lawton says that creationism is charged with being untestable and dogmatic and unfalsifiable, but that's all questionable according to Lawton. To make the claim that it isn't testable and to claim that it isn't falsifiable is pretty much tantamount to saying that it makes no empirical claims, and that's false. It does make claims. There are so many claims, such as Earth is being 6 to 20,000 years old, or the geological facts that are related to Noah's flood, factual historical claims in regards to the Old Testament, limited variability of species, and so on. They're all testable, and all have been tested, and all failed those tests. Science's strongest argument isn't that creationism cannot be falsified, and isn't empirical, but that it has made empirical claims, and if anything has ever been falsified, it's creation science. You see, Lawton is worried we will immunize creationism from empirical confrontation. He says, the correct way to combat creationism is to confute the empirical claims it does make not to pretend that it makes no such claims at all. He does admit that it is true that some things they say can't be tested, like God directly being a part of creation of man, but that doesn't mean that the whole thing is unscientific. 
Since we now know and acknowledge that there are many scientific claims as not testifiable in isolation, but only embedded in a larger system of statements, some of whose consequences can be submitted to test. Larry Lawton goes on to say that the idea that creationism is not revisable is simply not true. If you compare the old creationists to the new modern ones, you can see revisions that were made. They did change how much species variability there is, for example, and that's no doubt because of all the evidence of how many species actually are. Maybe Overton meant something about their having core assumptions. Like for example that there was a Noachian flood, or man did not evolve from lower animals, or that God created the world. But get ready for the coon. Historical and sociological researchers on science show every epoch has commitment to some beliefs that they regard as non-negotiable. Anyway, he says numerous historians and philosophers of science have documented the existence of certain degree of dogmatism about core commitments in the scientific research and have argued that such dogmatism plays a constructive role in promoting the aims of science. Now he does go on to note that he's not denying the subtle and important differences in the dogmas of science versus the dogmas of creationism but don't act like all science doesn't have any dogma or else we wouldn't have even the ability to get to those differences. Now I personally think this is just a distracting evasion that Lawton tries to pull. If you are admitting the differences are important, then you are leaving the stage for how important differences lead to charges being damaging to one and not the other. And so it is important in this respect that we must still raise the charge against our opponent precisely because it brings up those important differences. So let's look at it, not just ignore it. Lawton says that it is an ad hominem charge of dogmatism against creationism and confuses doctrine with the people who believe in it. Just because the people who believe in creationism are dogmatists has no bearing on the status of creationism itself. What counts is the epistemic status of creationism, not the cognitive idiosyncrasies of the creationists. What Laden means to say here is basically that just because the people are dogmatic religious people doesn't necessarily mean that creationism itself is dogmatic and therefore we don't have to treat creationism as if it isn't revisable and testable. Such a charge would be ad hominem, saying that creationism is therefore dogmatic because the people are dogmatic, levying the argument against the people onto the ideology, which is an ad hominem, but I think this idea is an error. The charge is not actually ad hominem. It is not that creationists are dogmatic, but that creationism actually is. That creationism demands dogmatism. Anyway, back to Laden. What about the other pair of essential characteristics? That is, it's a, a matter of natural law or explainable by natural law. It's really rather fuzzy says Lawton. Seriously? That's the defense? It's fuzzy? Okay, let's see. The general idea is that it's unscientific to postulate the existence of any process or that it can't be explained in terms of known scientific laws. To suggest an existence claim is unscientific until we can found laws on which our alleged phenomenon depends upon is simply outrageous. Look at Galileo and Newton. They knew of existence of gravity before anyone could explain it. Or look at Darwin. He established natural selection half a century before anyone knew about the workings of genetics. So was Newton and Darwin's work unscientific? The real objection to creationists is just that there is more evidence against their theories, not that they are untestable. I could continue with this tale of woeful fallacies, but it's unnecessary. This way of attacking creationism is the predominant tactic of scientists. But testability, revisability, and falsifiability are exceedingly weak requirements. It can be argued that creationism already satisfies these. It's easy for creationists to say, I will abandon my views if you can find a living specimenism of species intermediate between ape and man, and all formal requirements could be satisfied. Uh, this has happened, but forever explanatory gap atheists do know about and it doesn't satisfy them at all. This is because they do say that but they don't honestly and earnest mean it, still meaning that there is no falsifiability, they're just saying it. Laden says rather than taking them on an unscientific charge, we should just confront them directly and ask what evidence comes for or against either one. Does the evidence provide stronger arguments for creationism or evolution? 
That's how we'll decide which belongs in the classroom. Putting attention trying to define science in order to judge the status of creationism as a science or not distracts from the real issue. Lund then goes on to attack the editor of the Skeptical Inquirer and then notes quickly that Judge Overton was explicitly venturing into philosophical terrain and his judgment was way off the mark, as far off as creationism is from geology. You can't simply use falsifiability when it suits your case to say something isn't science and then ignore it when somebody tries to point out that science doesn't use falsifiability either. We should not be using an old and out of date philosophy as if it were the correct one only because it makes it seemingly easier to reject what we consider non-science. So basically Larry Lawton isn't actually attacking uh, scientists or, or defending atheists, he's just trying to say that the judgment that Judge Overton laid out wasn't good enough, that the system that he used to judge what is and isn't science is too weak, and that instead of saying that creationism isn't science and saying that's why we should keep it out of the classroom, we should just say that there's more evidence for the science we're using than there is for creationism and that's why we're leaving it out of the classroom. Michael Roos with Pro Judas responds to this by saying sure Lawden is entertaining but he's one way off the mark. First off, I was the one who's actually participating in the trial and I must say I was impressed by Overton's handling of the case. Secondly, Overton knows that proof of something isn't science isn't the same as proof of something that it is religion. It was the lawyers who went beyond simply trying to show that creation science isn't science, but trying to show positively that creation science is religion. Thirdly, Lawden's strategy against creation science is simply not good enough legally. Then Roos points out, the thing is, the US Constitution does not bar the teaching of weak science. So Roos is trying to point out that if we went the Larry Lawden way and tried to show that uh, creation science simply doesn't have as much empirical evidence as the evolutionary science that we believe, that would still be enough legal room to allow for creation science to be taught in the science classroom. So we don't want to say that it doesn't have enough empirical evidence, but we want to say systemically that it is not a science. Roos goes on to say about the US Constitution that it bars religion, so that's the goal really, to show that creation science is religion. That no, it isn't science, it is religion. Not that there is a dichotomy necessarily. Richard Dawkins would probably say yes there is. It is either science or religion, but not both. Never both. Now on to the main issue. Roos says he sees three questions that need answering. 1. Can we demarcate science from non-science? If yes. 2. Does creation science fail to fit the demarcation of what falls into the criteria of science? If yes. 3. Did Overton's opinion reflect that? Firstly. I admit there are philosophical problems and yeah, stating Karl Popper's falsification as though it's a simple demarker isn't good enough. But just because there isn't clear exact limits doesn't mean that there isn't clearly different things. He says, although there may be many gray areas, white does seem to be white and black does seem to be black. The truth is many philosophers make this point against this mistake. A familiar tactic is to question the legitimacy of a distinction because it is not perfectly clear in all cases. However, in many areas of philosophy, we find that this is insufficient because there are still clear cases that there are countable because some distinctions do exist. Stand roughly over there still has meaning even though there isn't an exact boundary. This is from Wittgenstein from his On Certainty. Roos goes on to say that furthermore, the five criteria for science do in fact do a good job to distinguish at least those white areas from the black areas, never mind the gray areas. For example, Mendel's law versus transubstantiation. One is clearly science and one clearly isn't science. Transubstantiation is the idea you can turn one substance into another. So Michael Roos is kind of referring to Christ's ability to turn his blood into wine. And that's what he's going to make use of as an example here. Now first, for Mendel's law, there is law and explanation, there is a testability, and there was rejection. Tentative and something empirical, something that can change our minds. But when it comes to transubstantiation, we hear that God may have his own laws, but neither scientists nor priests can tell which ones were the ones that turned blood into wine. There is no explanation. In fact, it says, there is no empirical evidence that is pertinent to the miracle nor would believers be swayed by any empirical fact. In this sense, it is definitely not tentative. Sure, this is just a pair of examples, but at least it shows that Overton's system isn't as irrelevant as Lawton implies. 
Then Michael Roos goes on to make a point about how, yeah, it does seem like some scientists in the past have done things which don't have to do with laws, natural laws and science, but what Michael Roos would say is not that we should think of them as doing science without some laws being enforced about natural laws or reference to natural laws, or rather we should just think that they're messing around with non-science. But even if we don't go with Michael Roos's version of saying that they're messing around with non-science rather than say that they're messing around with science that doesn't have laws, so what? If earlier in the 19th century it was more allowable that science could have reference to non-natural laws, science today has evolved and now in the late 20th century it is not allowable. Roos goes on to ask what about tentativeness? Lawton says science is hardly tentative. That's when he dropped that coon. Sure, scientists sometimes do hold on to things, even when there are signs that they should be more suspect. But to what degree they held on to those things can be very exaggerated. Michael Roos says, not to say that the empirical evidence is all decisive, it plays a major role in such mind changes. He gives an example, in 1960, I was taught continents do not move, and 10 years later they moved based on new empirical evidence that persuaded geologists. So sure, scientists are not as open-minded to refutation as Karl Popper thinks, but that doesn't mean that they're as close-minded as Kuhn thinks either. Roos implies it's Kuhn himself, and not merely those who use Kuhn to support relativism and reject objectivity in science, but that it is actually Kuhn himself that considers the role of actual phenomena unimportant. Now, I don't really know how true this is of Kuhn. I've always read Kuhn as still allowing for the important role of phenomena, especially in the idea of what counts as gross failure, which is a reason that adds to crisis. But back to Roos, now he moves on to the second and third question. After making a real cutsy comment, saying, The slightest acquaintance with creation science literature and creationism movement shows that creationism fails abysmally as science. Roos uses example of Dwayne T. Gersh and quotes him, By creationism we mean special creation. We can never know how or by what process God used. Scientific investigation cannot discover them. Roos also uses an example of Henry M. Morris quoting him as saying something along the lines of only God was actually there back then so we can never really know for sure through science, only God knows, and we should only know through what God tells us. Roos uses these examples to show see that by their own words, there are things that they have to believe beyond what is explainable by laws that humans can grasp, not just that we don't know them yet, but that we never can at all. Further, there is nothing tentative about their central claims. The Creation Research Society, to be a member for it, makes you sign a document that they do and will always believe that the Bible is the word of God, Genesis is factual, that the flood did happen, and only through Jesus Christ can one have salvation. Obviously, this isn't science. And all these quotes and references that were just presented by Roos were presented by Judge Overton as well. Finally, he adds about Laudan's claim that some parts of creation science are falsifiable and other parts are revisable. They are not. Their writing and stated intentions show they will believe flood of the world regardless of evidence. It's actually truly unfalsifiable. Any revisions are just exploitations of ambiguity in their own positions. For example, what kinds means. And he quotes Dwayne Grish's wide use of it. There is no true resemblance between the creationist treatment of their concept of kind and the openness expected of scientists. Nothing can be said in favor of creation science or its inventors. Finally, Michael Roos claims, after the battle is done, that Overton emerges unscathed by Laudan's complaints. So who won? Well, I think in a way Roos wins the battle, but Laudan's curse remains. Sure, Roos does win, because of course Roos is right. Laudan's alternative that we challenge creation science on evidence rather than try to show it's not science is such a terrible idea I have a terrible time believing Laudan would be seriously suggesting this. As Roos says, the constitution doesn't bar bad science. The issue at hand is an issue of demarcation, not how much evidence one side has and whether we can empirically confront the other side. However, on the other hand, Laudan is right. 
Philosophers of science, not that we'd want to defend creation science in this legal scenario, but we could have done a better job in attacking Overton's criteria, showing science itself couldn't hold up to it. But unfortunately, and maybe also ironically, I think many philosophers of science could have expressed the real concern behind that which could eventually haunt us. Better than Laudan showed in this piece anyway. Roos is right though, I think Overton's criteria for demarcation is sufficient for black and white cases, and this is a black and white case. The criterion is good enough to keep these creation scientists at least, this specific group of people and their belief in creation science, out of the classroom. However, in philosophic battle, it isn't a great strategy to pick at the minor appendages of your enemy. Instead, we should aim at the organs. Don't merely look at and challenge each of your enemy's attacks, but figure out the sentiment behind those attacks. And if you are an excellent warrior, you would even offer to improve and present the most sympathetic and powerful arguments you can even conceive of for your enemy's sentiments and then still demonstrate that they can be crushed. But that's not what happened here. Sure, the criteria works here and for those black and white cases. Certainly, revisability of these creation science advocates is feeble compared to the openness of science. Their dogmas are on a wholly different level. This is why I brought up that comment of it being an evasion to bring up that they both have dogmas and then just leave it there like that without discussing further how different they are. But what happens when it's not so black and white? Roos fails to address the seriousness of possibly establishing legal precedents in using what Laudan correctly addresses as an old and out-of-date philosophy of science. Even Roos agrees that it is problematic. I'm talking especially about falsification here. My take on it and the way I would phrase it here just to help people kind of understand is to sort of think of it as if there were at least four stages to understanding science. Stage one is verificationism. This is the where the logical positivists would be like air, uh, what you might learn in high school to observe and confirm hypotheses empirically. Stage two is where Karl Popper is and falsification. And I think that's kind of where the Dunning-Kruger effect might take place. People might begin to learn about science, learn a little bit about falsification and think they know much more about science than they really do. Because of course there is at stage 3 where there is Thomas Kuhn's paradigms and paradigm shifts and crisis. After that is stage 4 with pluralism versus monism and the battle currently happening in philosophy or stage 5 and beyond, whatever it is. While falsification is a wicked sharp powerful weapon, if you were trying to wield that weapon against a philosopher studying at stage 4 plus, Boy, we're gonna smack that weapon out your hand so fast, we're gonna do it so carelessly with slang. All like, man, everybody know falsification don't happen. Kuhn. And if the philosopher were to do that just by name dropping Kuhn like Laudan did, which is the usual response, it would pay to move to stage 3 and learn how we can demarcate using Kuhn's puzzle solving, if demarcation is what you were doing while you were wielding falsification anyway. In fact, Kuhn believes it's an even sure way of demarcating the falsification. But if that's what I'm suggesting to you, then why wouldn't I suggest that to Overton? Is it only because those creation science lawyers hadn't evolved enough to know how to drop Kuhn like Laudan implies when he says they botched their case? Look, I know it was only the Eastern District of Arkansas, but if this were a world government having the opportunity to really set the legal marker for what counts as science, then I would desperately hope they wouldn't go ahead and use a criteria philosophers of science no longer use and is already known to be actually not true of science. That would establish the legal backing of science in a weak position. What happens then when creation science advocates eventually figure this out and figure out a way to use that weak position to their advantage. Or what if it were something more gray than the black and white cases? As I said earlier, how easy would it be for someone defending their gray by attacking science as not being able to live up to its own now established legal criteria? That's the haunting, that curse of Laudan, which I think persists beyond the strategies Roos took to defeat Laudan in his response. What are your thoughts? Would you have used puzzle solving instead of falsification? 
And besides the issue of Popper versus Kuhn or falsification versus paradigm shifts, isn't there something else missing from this criteria? Please stay tuned to this channel and these shows. I'm going to go over these huge impactful difference and switch over from Popper to Kuhn from stage two to stage three as I phrased it. It's really important to figure it out. Funding. I need funding. Some of my videos take 90 plus hours and if you take that 90 and you plus hours that's a lot of time. I can't just churn out these kind of videos with little effort like a react video or an ASMR video or stealing clips of other people's works, cartoons or just reading comments off the internet. So obviously I don't have a lot of videos or a huge fan base. I'm new and I don't know if you know this but YouTube doesn't reward or make it easy for unestablished high quality production YouTubers. If anything they make it way way harder especially on shows like mine. So if you think I deserve to exist here and I deserve some support I humbly humbly request that you yes you actually log into your Google account and subscribe to my channel. Watch my videos and actually actually share my videos. Now if you're thinking oh the internet has millions of people online and surely someone else can do it. Someone else can support this guy. I'm sure a lot of people will do it eventually. Well guess what? They won't. And I need and want it to be you to join me on this hardcore awesome philosophical journey. But the best way to ensure the journey continues even without bajillions of subs is by supporting me on Patreon. A few of the dollars you might have spent on garbage food could instead really help fund this production and ensure I keep making more videos on philosophical battles that you're just gonna love so much. While all my early subscribers are special and will be noticed by me definitely, my Patreon supporters will get a special rewards, not just shoutouts but even influence on the direction of the philosophical path itself. Not just in the philosi but also in other battlefields as well. So believe me for a small small YouTuber like me it makes a big difference I definitely will notice and you will be actually contributing in a meaningful way. Thanks.